Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. And uh, Richard, who's here, is going to talk to us all about uh, the Asian hornet and how to survive beekeeping with that predating your bees. Anyway, I'll hand it over to you, Richard. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen first. Hope that works fine. How are we doing? Um, no, that's not working. Give me a second. Where are we gone? Here we go. Right. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, uh, I'm um, going to obviously run through uh, all about keeping bees with Asian hornets. And I say successful beekeeping with Asian hornets. <laughs> it's successful in the words that we do the best we can. Nothing is perfect, okay? So um, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all here to all people in Ireland and all across uh, what appears to be all across the world. It's fantastic to see so many of you turning up. I hope this talk will be interesting. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself first, uh, so you kind of understand what I do and where I am and where we're based. And then hopefully from there, you can kind of see how we deal with this problem, which is France-wide, Europe, well, it's, it's moving into Europe, but you'll see that as we progress. So obviously I do queen rearing as well. And you might see my videos, I do a lot of YouTubing stuff. That's the kind of thing that we do a lot in the summer, raising our own queens from our own stock. All good fun. So um, tonight's topics will be all about me, the overview of my operation, what happens and when, and then we'll get onto the nitty gritty of Asian hornets within my beekeeping. And then I'm more than happy to answer as many questions as you want afterwards. And I'm hoping we can have a few people, you know, really ask ask some interesting questions because I don't know it all we're just going to try and answer as many as we can we are learning as we're going along with this problem to be honest so um all about me uh, I'm 49 years old born and grew up in Jersey Channel Islands uh, studied horticulture in in the UK and then changed my job and became a paramedic in the uh, states of Jersey ambulance service and then I jacked all that in came back to France well back came to France um, obviously Jersey being so close is not that far away from where I was originally born and then I went back to doing uh, my gardening training and then I did landscape gardening and uh, I was doing uh, um, landscape gardening and beekeeping I got my first hives in 2009 first three hives and then I've actually uh, became a professional beekeeper January 2019 which was obviously uh, three years ago or two years ago, last January. And that was when I was able to have enough bees and enough colonies to say, right, this is what I want to do for my main income. But I have been doing my other activity of um, landscape gardening until only last October. But last October, I finally jacked it all in, and now I'm just a beekeeper. And this, because there's just too much to do. You cannot do two things at once. So this is where I live. Um, Beautiful house in the middle of the Breton countryside. This was the picture I took two weeks ago. So we do have all weathers, but it was the first decent snow we've had in about 10 years. So uh, really, really beautiful. This is the valley I live in. Um, we're actually quite high up here. If you look at where the little dot is, that's exactly where my, where my house is. And we have valley all around, which offers um, really good diversity of food. We also live in, a, this town is called Corsell, which is actually an old Roman Gallo town. And it was obviously a big trading route. And this is one of the uh, places you can visit. This is our main village high street kind of thing there. You might see this every day and I drive past and other people think it's amazing, but it's like we see it every day. So, but it's lots of things like this all over the place and they've been preserving it all and uh, used as a museum as well, you can visit. There you go, that's our village, that's how you spell it. So this is exactly where I am in relation to the coast. You can see Jersey there. And this red, red area is where I have all my apiaries. And I run non-migratory apiaries. In other words, I don't move my hives around generally. I have fixed apiaries because we only have two flows a year. We have a spring flow, and then which is mostly the usual spring flowers. 
dandelions, going to orseed rape, going to blackthorn, all that kind of stuff, hawthorn, all the kind of stuff you get in the rest of Europe. And then in the summer, we have a big, big chestnut flow and bramble flow, which comes the second week of June till the second week of July. So it's a really great place to live, pretty diverse. That's the pollens we get. You can see there's so many different colors there. And uh, this, was, this was actually pollens from the bottom of my garden, right next to a field of oilseed rape. So you can see there's very little rapeseed pollen in that and compared to the other pollens there, we get huge diversity. So it's really, really good for the bees. And obviously in relation to the UK, this just gives you some idea of uh, whereabouts I am. So uh, my vision, I'd like to, I like to tell people what I want to do because they ask me what my goals are, and it's to run a sustainable beekeeping operation, to harvest honey and products from the hive, spread the word about good wholesome beekeeping practices and inspire and collaborate with others to promote bees and beekeeping, including selective breeding. So we're really busy here. We do get involved with as many things as we can. Um, I work with my colleague in the workshop and he is involved with the beekeeping groups here and he's quite high up in the, the bee breeding groups as well. So we all kind of sing off the same song sheet and work together, but we're, we're always really, really busy. So here's how it all started. My first three Daydon hives, I do have Daydon hives to make a point of that. And I have Daydon hives because um, everybody in France has Daydon hives really. There's a few people have Langstroth and a few people have Warre hives, but majority have data and the problem is if you're a professional beekeeper and you want to sell colonies you can't sell them on something else that no one wants to buy you have to sell them on data data isn't really the best hive for keeping bees in Brittany if you really wanted to have the best colonies to have a winter we would say you can go to um, Vuano which is, is, is an even deeper frame and that gives you more um, more honey for the bees in the winter, but we have to stick with Daydon and it's a good compromise. They're, they're, they're not a bad hive. So now I've got, I roughly have 200 production colonies. Obviously it dips a bit in the spring because you get the end of the winter losses and I obviously will have more in the summer, but I'm growing now and because I'm now professional full time. I want to run at 250 production hives and that's the apps about the maximum one person can run on their own in France. I also run about 60 mini mating nukes all, all the time and obviously nukes I sell in the spring and later in, later in the year. So I'm going to quickly run through our beekeeping year. It's probably very similar to what you do. February, March, we're doing our first inspections, assessing and sorting our uh, winter losses, checking store levels. And we generally don't have a problem with stores this time of year. The, the only thing that does is nukes. Um, our day on hives do generally hold enough honey to go right into mid-April. That's when we generally start getting our nectar back in. Um, in April and May, we got the start of the spring buildup, and it's already starting now this year. Um, we, get, we do regular checks like most people do, and then we're adding honey supers middle of April to middle of May, and we're selling our nukes. So it's a really, really busy time, like all you people are out there at that time of year. Um, the, really, the first four months of the season, once that's out of the way, I'm kind of relieved because then it's like, everything can be done at a better pace, but those four months are so intense. And in May, we're harvesting spring honey, we're extracting uh, as fast as we can because the obviously the, a lot of our honey, it's not just the rapeseed oil, a lot of our honey uh, does crystallize really, really quickly. So we have to get it off the highs within two weeks of it going into the, into the cells. We also start queen rearing May sometimes, uh, depends on how, um, cold or warm it is in the season but in May and June we start making our first splits and making our first increases um, and we obviously start making our first mini nukes. Now mini mating nukes we use solely for producing extra queens so we can requeen lots of hives. We do use that as a method of our swarm production is keeping our queens changed on the second year usually but it never really works out like that because we're always chasing our tail but this year it's going to be perfect. <laughs> so <laughs> I wish, but that's the plan. And uh, into May and June, uh, more Queen Mary, uh, getting production hives back up to strength after the spring, uh, summer, sort of the spring uh, honey is harvested because you always get some swarming. You've always got to rush around requeening colonies, trying to get them strong because we've got a month of a gap. Um, we don't have a June gap. We have a mid-May to mid-June gap. And then as I say, mid-June, our, our main flow starts for the summer. 
queen mooring, swarm checks, all in June, as I say, making nucleus colonies. And at the start of the season, we have mimosa, which is just in flower now. And what's happened this year is some of it's been burnt by the frosty weather we had, but there is a good proportion that's still viable. And the bees today, I was out doing some apiary work today, and bees were bringing in huge clumps of yellow, this bright yellow pollen, and it's absolutely brilliant. And it's, if it goes calm and still, it can be an absolute bonus, but it's so variable in this time of the year. Sometimes there's nothing for them. We get dandelions, like most people get. Our agricultural uh, fields are absolutely full of them. They generally don't spray them off anymore, which is great. So the bees do get a lot of food from that. Typical apiary in the spring, we have blackthorn. That's what you can see in the back there. There's just, just starting some blackthorn now, Prunus spinosa. Um, we seem to get two kind of types of the same plant, but one flowers early, one flowers a bit later within like three weeks of each other. This is a kind of classic sort of spring picture, early spring. Then we go on to the cherries, the wild cherries here, and you get the domestic cherries, and then you get this, which we have everywhere. Um, we don't seem to suffer from the problems that others do with rapeseed oil. And you don't have to move your hives to it. And as I said, ours are non-migratory because everywhere you go and you put your hives, you're always within three or four kilometers from a field of it, if not closer. Um, do I like this stuff? Yes, I do. Um, it doesn't seem to taint the honey so much. It doesn't make it too bland. Our spring honey is really floral because there's so many other things at the same time. We aim to put our supers on in the second week of this flowering. So we get a defined period of honey, uh, of nectar flow that we can catch. And by that time, our colonies are built up a little bit. The problem is now, this seems to be flowering earlier and earlier each year. And it's like often the bees just aren't ready to receive it. So it's actually good and bad, but good because we don't have to work so hard to get our colonies built up in time, but bad because it, so it's going to get so early that well, bees will never be ready for it, if you know what I mean. So you know, we always get some, some years is more than others. So obviously we've got to extract quickly, um, each, different apiaries, different strengths. Um, woodland apiaries obviously don't give so much spring honey, but it's still good. So uh, every, every apiary gives spring honey though, as a whole, and some give, gives more than others. We get um, in right in the middle of this photo, that, that shrub there, that's a prunus paedus or bird cherry. And behind it, it's hawthorn, you obviously all know that, but to, to me and to us here, the hawthorn is our marker and it's the kind of, it says to us, right, this is the last thing that's going to flower because the hawthorn flowers, hawthorn being, uh, I think it's, uh, it's one of the apple family, malus. Um, so yes, yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, I can't remember it's malus, but anyway, it's um, one of the last things to flower at the same time as the apples. And what I'm trying to, my point is when this flowers, um, it's the last thing to flower. And I know from then on that it's the end of the spring flow. It's like a curtain comes down. There is pollen around, but it's, um, but the, this is also, just remember it's Crataegus monogyna. It's not very good on my names this evening, but um, when, when this finishes, that is it. Our spring flow just stops and there is no more nectar. So it's time to make sure everything's harvested and then we move on to the next thing. Then we're on to the getting ready for the summer flow because it's it's a very very short six months for everybody as you know june july then we're, we're we're basically getting our supers back on the minute they're extracted um we obviously want to give space to our queens that's, that's the number one thing um then we're rushing around trying to get colonies queen right so that they can either uh, we kind of look at it as if you if you lose colonies in the spring and the, and the colonies depleted you have to do a few things you can either work on the fact that it will never give you summer honey, but you can use the summer flow to make it strong enough so that at the end of the summer flow, you can make a split from it. Um, or you can just basically use, use the summer flow to grow bees. Or you can just you can stick a super on it anyway. But the chances are, if your colonies are swarmed in the spring, they don't really give you much summer honey. So we kind of just spend the whole time um, tr almost triaging colonies with however, whatever they are. And obviously, we hope you have enough to give a good summer, summer crop. And we go through June and into July doing that. And then obviously July is, we're adding our last supers the last week of July because really after 
the first week of August, there's, that's it. Our nectar flow from the summer finishes well, like a curtain coming down again. Second week of July, it's finished. There's nothing else. So it's like almost like whew, that was a big ride, you know, it's like, woo, we're finished now. But then we're into the uh, next phase of uh, the, the big summer harvest because our summer, our summer flow is generally the biggest flow. And then we've got to get, like everybody, we've got to race to get our harvest off, get the mite treatments in and get the colonies ready for the winter because it all starts there. Um, really, um, there's nothing really major here, any different than you, all you guys do over there. Um, it's, it's just a, a work through the process. There's so much work to do. Um, we do splits at that time as well. And we usually give those mated queens from our mini nukes. Into October, we're removing mite treatments and we're preparing the, for the winter. We're also trapping a lot of Asian hornets then because the nests are coming to the end of their life cycle and they're pouring out um, Asian hornets everywhere. Uh, like everyone else, November, December, winter preparation, adding insulation, centralizing the brood, the last feed, blah, blah, blah. It's just a classic kind of beekeeping year, the same as most people. So a few photos of the, of the summer, uh, summer harvest, mostly chestnut and bramble. And I, I, I said this the other day, we're lucky here because we have a lot of bramble that comes at the same time as our, as our chestnut trees. Chestnut honey is very, very dark and very strong. But our bramble that comes along at the same time actually softens it down and it's, it, it lightens it in colour and gives it a much, much better flavour for us. So we're really lucky. Classic bramble. There's our chestnut. It's absolutely prolific here. We have valleys full of the stuff. And uh, it absolutely, I find it absolutely absolutely reeks, you can actually smell it. The hives almost get this like greeny yellow tinge to them and so do the bees for those three weeks of the, of the summer months. It's absolutely amazing. It's just so prolific. There's the trees we get, everywhere's like that. It's absolutely fantastic. And if you get um, a kind of quite a bit of groundwater in late spring, it usually kind of secures your summer. Where we do well is if you have it doesn't matter if it's really wet in, or, or, or rains a little bit in, in late summer, it doesn't, it, it doesn't have any effect, it doesn't help the nectar. What you want is a good wet winter like we've had and then it to be kind of wet in April and May. And then after the spring flow, if that groundwater's still there, then the chestnut trees can really, really pour it out. Because these are big trees with deep roots, so they're relying on groundwater supplies. So it's kind of a, a weird thing, you know. That's what we get, valleys like that everywhere. With um, it, it's very topographic, uh, Brittany. Um, we have all these little hills and valleys, but nothing major. Just, just kind of enough to give little little breaks of forest areas, so you get good diversity of wildlife and, and pollens and everything like that. So it's really ideal. That's what we like to see. Nice um, honey supers full of honey after the main flow. Now, just a little bit about this picture. We use uh, the plastic. Uh, Frames, they are just that's a plastic Nico frame um, made by uh, obviously Nico, but it's called a Baticad in France. And we, this one, for instance, this is a box of 10 frames. Okay. So I'll try and explain very briefly. You might have seen me talk about this in my video. What we do is we, uh, we reuse the same frames. If they, if they get wax moth or if they get pollen in, we have to scrape the frames out, but we can pressure wash them and then the bees rebuild them. But when we rebuild them, they have to be rebuilt on tens. Okay. Because otherwise the bees build in between here. But once you have them rebuilt, you can then use them for the summer flow and then they, they fill these up or you can space them into eight. So the next frame is, uh, well, there that's the same frame, but um, just shows you what kind of honey we get into it. But they're all kind of uniform when you build them on tens. When you move them to eight, you, you increase the spacing on your frames so you can have more honey on, on less frames and it's more economical for us. So you get lovely frames of honey and there's only eight frames to move each time. So uh, it's kind of, a, we're, we're constantly looking at frames, moving them, trying to maintain our, our eights, we call it, but we obviously have to, there's a certain amount have to get rebuilt every year. That's how we do our, our supering. We, you know, in terms of what frames we use. Our main broodness frames are all, um, are all uh, wax foundation. We, we try and save enough of our foundations so that we can, take it back to the shop and get them, not our shop, but the, the beekeeping supplies we buy a gear from there, melt, melt down our own wax and they'll give it back to us for a price. 
So that's really good. And we try and do that with all our brood nests, but the, but the supers are all in plastic. And we only, I think we've only thrown three super frames away in the last what, 12 years since I've been using those. So they're really good and they're really environmentally good because you get a lot of use out of them. So this is my extraction room. Well, this is our extraction. My colleague and I share it. Very briefly, I'll run through this before we get stuck into the Asian Hornet side of stuff. But um, like most people, we have a system. It works for us. It's not super high tech. If we were to replace things now, the things would be a little bit different. But um, we, uh, we um, bring our honey in uh, on these twin, well, we have one rolling pallet there. So it's four wheel pallet, two wheels at the front are directional so you can steer it around. And on top, we've got a, another device that enables us to stack two stacks of supers on. So we get about seven, eight high of honey supers. We wheel those into the workshop and they end up about uh, over here. And then over here, they're decapped, deboxed, and we run them through this machine. This machine is a, uh, vertical decapper. So the frames go in there and they go across the, the spinning flanges and it decaps the, um, the wax off the plastic frames. And then the frames come out here and go into one of our twin extractors. These are, these are twin uh, 32 frame extractors, uh, Carl Hest ones, really, really great. Uh, the honey then uh, comes out the other side you can't see of the extractors into the sump. This sump here has baffles, and the baffles basically collect the wax. Not all of it. You can see there's a little bit on the top of the barrel there. But when the honey migrates down this sump, it hits the pump. And when the float switch activates, the honey is pumped into the barrel. So it's a very, very simple way for us to extract our honey. It's, it's kind of a commercial way, but it's also very simple with no frills. You know, that's what, you, that's what we need what you need as a commercial beekeeper. This machine underneath here is a honey spinner. Now you generally don't buy these now because they've been kind of superseded by the, the skewer press that a lot of people have. And instead of having to empty this out every day, which we do, it's like, a, like the old fashioned spin dryers. If you ever remember those days where you'd have washing and you put it into this device that just spins and you have a tap here that lets the water out as it spins faster and faster and works its way across the kitchen floor. Um, this kind of is exactly the same, but it's bolted to the ground and all the, uh, all the dross and all the liquid slurry of honey that is scraped off the frame, sometimes it scrapes a little bit more off, all falls down into this machine, it spins it, and out there it comes is your uh, nice bucket of honey, which is it's amazing how much you get out of your cappings. And then obviously we empty this out, which is a little bit time consuming, but we get dry cappings that we can melt down straight away and get very little honey in them. So that's one good piece of kit. It's an old piece of kit, but it still works absolutely fine. As I said, if it was, if it was to be changed, we'd, we'd do other things now, but it, there's nothing wrong with it. With beekeeping and a small income, you have to invest and then use it for a long time. So that's what we like to see at the end of it, two barrels of chestnut honey. And I know it's chestnut because <laughs> By the time I took the photo of the, of the lens opening and closing it would have probably crystallized. That's how quickly it turns. Now I know this is summer honey because it's dark. And uh, I know when this photograph is taken, but that's kind of what we do. We then obviously put the lid on the barrel and we um, just put it outside where it's cool or it's stored in the shade. And then when we want to um, use it, we either sell barrels or we'd sell it, in, sell it in buckets. But the majority of our honey is sold in barrels. I don't do my own pots yet but i'm going into that very very soon and that's what i'm doing now designing my label and obviously i know i can make a lot more money selling in pots but we get really good prices for honey in barrels so it's kind of a dilemma it's always one thing getting the honey into barrels but it's another thing selling it in pots and going to markets so uh so that was another picture of uh i do queen rearing as you know and i like to um show everyone my pictures because they make great great showstoppers but that's the uh, cell builder from last year and that's ready to take a graft uh, that was the frame i took out from the middle and the pollen frame has gone in already so this is just waiting for this is a hopelessly queenless colony ready to have some grafting and if you so say if you want to find out more about that you can um watch one of my talks someone later on or log on to my website so there's the result we get nice queen cells <laughs> And I'll be honest, honest with you, I wish they were all like that, but they're not. <laughs> so
So that's what we kind of aim to do. That's how we work. Um, look at the raw jelly in that completely full of raw jelly, those cells. Absolutely beautiful. That's if I get them all like that, I'm a happy person. So that was my beekeeping, what I do, where we are. Now let's talk about the Asian Hornet. And that's obviously why you're here tonight. Is it a threat to beekeepers in the United Kingdom and Ireland? The first thing I'll say is please don't panic. There is a number of things that we are doing and everyone is learning that are putting into place to help deal with this problem. It's not perfect, but if, if you panic about it, it's not gonna get you through the season and you've gotta be um, realistic about your approach. So to start off, I'll obviously show you the difference between the two. We have uh, the common uh, Hornet Vespa Crabo on the right. I hope that's your right, that's the Vespa Crabo. Um, beautiful insect. You can usually hear the queens in the spring before you even see them because they're like a bus on, on wings, we call them. They are huge as they're flying around. Whereas this beastie is the um, Frenant Asiatique, they call it here, or the Asian Hornet, uh, Vespa nigrothorax. And it has these different markings where it has the yellow band, the thin yellow band across the um, back of the, uh, just behind the thorax there and coming into the abdomen. And also you have the yellow feet. The biggest giveaway of all is the yellow feet. And they're slightly smaller than the common hornet. Okay, so that's the giveaway, all right? But you, you kind of learn that. And there is other ways, there's, there's an app out you can um, check. But from my point of view, I wanted you to see this just to, as a starting point. Now, I mentioned this before, this is Vespa Mandriana. This is the murder hornet. This is nothing to do with the Asian hornet in Europe, okay? Nothing at all. And obviously, I'm sure most beekeepers are aware of that. And this picture is a classic example of where it's completely wrong because, first of all, this was used as this is the Asian hornet that's going to kill everyone in the UK and Ireland. Well, it was obviously we know it wasn't. But this is also now what's been banded around in Washington state as the murder hornet. But this is Vespa Mandriana, which is actually in Washington state. Whether they've controlled it, we're waiting to see because they did find a nest last year and destroy it. But this picture has actually been doctored anyway. And you can see this is so out of proportion. So uh, it's just to show you just a, a point of reference, but it's nothing to do with the Asian hornet here. It's a, it's a different species. It's, is a, sorry, it's, is, a, is a species of Vespa, but it's not the same species we have here. So, if we have a look at this um, chart, this will give you the reasons why we kind of do what we do here and why it's not a major problem, why we can work around the problem with Asian hornets. Because around here, this is the time scale of as things happen, it starts January there, June, July, August, it goes around clockwise. And you've got various stages of the, um, this is the female emerging in the spring. And here she is making her first starter nest. That's what these hornets do. They make a small starter nest on their own. This queen is responsible for raising that nest on her own until she can raise enough workers that she can stay in the nest. And then, excuse me, and then she can um, stay in the nest and lay away while the workers she's raised do the work for her. Okay, and that's what we call a starter colony, a primary nest. OK, so for me here, we are now mid-February and these queens are out and about, we think. We haven't seen any. I haven't seen one yet this year, but they're out and about and they are um, starting to raise their first primary nest. OK, and they'll do that behind a shed or in a log pile or anywhere in a hollow of a tree, but anywhere that's protected because this is a risky time for this queen. OK, so uh, going quickly, briefly to the other end of the year in October, November, the males die off and these females emerge from the, the, the nest. OK, and then they will then hibernate over the winter somewhere where they can find it safe and dry. And then they emerge now. And that's the ones we target. This is our big weapon. So trapping starts here and it's the best time. I put best trapping period, but it's really it should say best control period because we trap a lot of Asian hornet queens in the spring and we trap them really early off and often we trap them well well into the start of March we start seeing them in the net in the in the traps and we do not trap any other 
common hornets. We get a few about May time, but we just to say additionally, we don't we haven't really seen a decline in the common hornet since we've been trapping the Asian hornets in the spring, which is very interesting to note. So um, we're very happy about it because we don't want to trap the common hornet. So obviously, the uh, as I said, the queen makes this small nest and then uh, we trap from about January to June. And there's little point in trapping from then on because the, the workers, we don't seem to trap the workers, okay? We don't, the, the amount you get, all it does is maybe slightly weaken the colony. But if you trap a large amount of, of queens in the spring, you tend to reduce the amount and you don't see really, you don't really see workers in any numbers till this time of year, till June. But by then we finished our beekeeping by June, July. So the summer flow is just finished. We do our harvest and we do some splits and then we close our hives off and we um, are basically done for the year. But then we have to monitor things carefully. That's when our kind of work starts against, against the hornets. Because as I said, we can't really trap here because we, when the baits we use aren't really effective, they don't attract the workers in any numbers to do any significant damage. So it's a constant problem. And then uh, you get to here, and then what happens is this primary nest that the queen made, she migrates when the nest is, well, it's difficult, it's not really to say when the nest is the size of a football, but approximately June, July time, when it is about the size of a small football or slightly smaller, basically the nest empties out and then it migrates to the top of a tree because this September, August, July, going backwards is the time when the, the Asian hornets can really build a big nest quickly because they've got all the summer insects around the environment. They can predate them easily and they've got numbers of, in, numbers of workers to do it. So they very quickly build up and that's when you start to see this. That's when you start to see Asian hornets predating in front of your hives, okay? So the whole life cycle is the same as a wasps and a common hornet. They basically come out of hibernation, they build a small nest, they move to a bigger nest and then they build these huge nests and then they, then they produce queens and the nest dies and that's the life cycle of the year. So just to mention as well, one of the things we do try and do, and it does help a lot, especially last autumn, we had a very, very mild October, November. If we can, we trap in October, November, and sometimes you can get absolutely loads of queens uh, uh, leaving their nests and then looking for somewhere to hibernate. If you put some, um, we use a lot of apple cider vinegar based traps that time of year. And that seems to really attract them because at that time of year, we find they're really homing in on the fruit because they're looking for sugars to, to stock up on before they take that hibernation period. But it's very variable. And also that time of year, we, we know in the traps, we get a lot of workers that are just hanging around because the nest is basically finished. So this is this, the tiny little starter nest. Uh, this was a colleague, a friend of mine who uh, has a house near, near, near here. He said, I've got this little, I said, I don't know if it's a wasp. He said, will you come and have a look? I said, yeah, I'll come down early in the year. Got a bit of time. Beekeepers are busy, but I said, I'll have a look. And it's a starter nest for a Asian hornet. And I should be able to um, play you this. There's the queen making her nest. You see, she's quite a big, big insect. And that's what she does. She makes a nest somewhere in a doorway, exactly the classic scenario. And then she'll go off and to and fro, to and fro, gradually building that nest. And within two or three weeks, you'll have workers. And there is exactly um, the uh, young larvae that have been that were just growing. They would probably be, I would imagine, young adults in about two weeks, maybe 15, well, um, 12 days, I should say. There's the egg she's laid. So she was making this nest getting wider and wider. And obviously these are the larvae that were capped over because they have to pupate just like our bees do. But it's interesting. Uh, I just gave this a squirt with some insecticide and it was dead in no time. I mean, you could have just squashed it with a bit of two before, but I mean, you wanted to make sure the queen was dead because if not, she would have gone off and made a nest somewhere else, probably. But that gives you some idea of what she's doing this time of year. This was a nuke of mine. I put, I put swarm traps out and um, there was a, a starter nest in a, in a nuke. And you can see here that they build over three or four frames. And I've seen this many times and we do also get common hornets doing the same thing. So that was just a swarm trap, but it shows you exactly what they do. Quiet place, protected, plenty of food around. That's what they want. Now this is um, later on in the summer. I've taken this picture because it gives you some idea of what you're up against. 
um, and it puts it kind of all into relation. So there is the Asian hornet's nest right at the top of that tree. And there's probably 30 meters there between the top and the bottom. And there it is again. That Asian hornet's nest wasn't that big um, and it wasn't cut down. No one came along with a, a basket or anything. No one removed it, no one poisoned it. This produced queens. And this is what you see at the end of the year in Brittany. No one has the resources here to really do much about it, unfortunately. It's just uh, <laughs> the Asian hornets, if we don't do a good job of trapping, they, they make nests and they produce queens for the following year. This is uh, a smaller nest. This isn't the biggest we get here, but my point is this is what you get at the end of the season. You can see here, this is, um, I'm talking about these layers here, and this has got, um, looks like five brood chambers here. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not a scientist. I didn't know much about Asian hornets then, and I doubt I'd be able to tell you much more as to whether they were queens that were being produced, but it's pretty likely these were being, there were queens and drones being produced because this nest was killed in uh, late September, early October, I think. And um, at, that's at the time of year when they switch from raising the colony size, so they switch to producing drones. So um, that's what you get. There's a nest in a tree. I'll, I filmed this so you could see. Look how high that is. Total, we had no idea that was there. That's one of them. And there's another one right up there. So you can see what you're up against. They are virtually undetectable. There's virtually no way of finding the nest. And if you do, uh, well, there is ways of finding the nest, but when you've got limited resources, they are left to do what they want to do. So here's a nest in a plum tree. Plum trees lose their leaves quite quick, late summer. Um, it was early autumn and this was seven degrees. We just had a very, very light frost on the ground that morning, but the hornets were all flying. Very, very efficient creatures, pretty dynamic, and they were still growing this nest and the stream of hornets to and from it was incredible. But this was destroyed, this one. When I was talking about the layers before, you see how this nest is so much bigger. This is taken from south and southern France a couple of beekeepers, but it gives you some idea of the size of nests you get further south where the, the hornets are able to start earlier. They have more feed at an earlier time and higher temperatures. So you can see they are much more prolific. And that is a scary picture. So this was one in front of my garden, um, shocked me. I had no idea it was there, but it was in my uh, front of my house and uh, in the brambles. There's my house. This is at the front side of it. And there's the Asian hornet's nest, huge nest. Really, really strong workers there, plenty of workers. And uh, I didn't get stung by this one, but there was this, we think the primary nest was actually in another pile of brambles about hundred meters away. And I went into it looking at it and I got stung on the top of the head and I said it was not very present. But if you just, if you knock that nest, they are, that's the difference between Asian hornets and common hornets. If you knock a common hornet's nest, you'll be, you'll be unlucky if you get stung. If you knock the nest of an Asian hornet, you either got to be very quick on your feet and run like hell, or you will get stung lots of times unless you're wearing lots of protective clothing. So there you go. The problem we have is it's not um, killing the nest. They're fairly easy to kill, but it's just getting the treatment to them because you can't see them. And if you live in a wooded area, they are kind of allowed to just run riot, you know. So there you go, nice shape. That was the one that was in my garden. You can see here, it's a fairly good sized nest. And this, we don't think can produce queens because there's a lot of seal brood here. We think that was them producing drones and queens for mating for the end of the season. So uh, we think we got this one before it produced any. This was a swarm of bees I was called to on top of an oil tank, but obviously when I got there, it was not a swarm of bees. Um, you can see these are very, it was very much a huge Asian hornet's nest. And these, these um, Asian hornets actually were spitting venom at me, hovering in front of the nest and spitting venom at me when I looked at them a second time. They are extremely aggressive and you don't want to mess with them unless you know what you're doing. Just gives you some idea of the size of the nest.
You can also see the situation is just uh, in top of an oil tank. You have no idea they're there. So back to the um, chart, and this is where we can make some headway, okay? It just, I just wanted to come back to this so you can see um, those nests were, this was like August, September time. Actually, I think that one was actually September, October, but I've seen quite a few now. <laughs> but um, it just shows you how big they can get. And um, there's really no point in trapping between really end of June and November. You just got to make sure you get as many of the workers, the queens as you can in the spring. And when you get to this stage, uh, when you get to this stage here, this is when you see this. This is when you see hawking in front of your Conleys. There is your adult worker, Asian hornet. And look at the bees here. This is the problem you get, or we get. Um, we have on this picture our Asian hornet door. Now this stops the Asian hornet going into the entrance. The bees can come and go, but what the bees are doing instead is they've changed their tactics. They're under stress. And when they're stressed with Asian hornets, they tend to all group one side or the other of the colony. We don't know whether it's to help to take the pressure off the returning bees or whether it's the fact that they're kind of showing force against the hornets, it's difficult to say, but they all seem to cluster out the front. So there's the, the hornet trying to capture one of my bees. Um, they're not actually that successful, but if you ever watch a common hornet trying to do the same thing, they're a lot more successful. I'll just play that again. So you can see it. This is what they do. Um, they do this all the time. And there's the bees clustered around, stressed. What I do here is I let the nettles, this is very nettly, this area. I let the nettles grow in front of my hives so that um, it gives the bees a fighting chance to get back. And one of the tactics is to allow long grass to grow in front of your hives. And it, and it um, kind of gives them a, a second route, if you know what I mean. Okay, well, these are the doors we have against hornets. There's pros and cons for these doors. If you have a colony, so you made a split in the summer, the colony took, you may have taken the queen away or whatever, or the colony was queenless. It took a while to get queen right again. In that time, you've lost more bees. The colony is compromised. It weakened the colony. You haven't got a lot of bees in it. In, this, in that particular scenario, the hornet, if it could get in, would come in and finish, they would come in in numbers and probably finish off the colony if they could. But with, with the doors we have, it stops the hornets actually entering the hive. So that's a good thing. But the problem is it, the bees will still get stressed and the, any queens aren't really laying that much because they're stressed. So there's an example, two hives together. We have these bases made by Nico in France. They, they fit all the Dayton hives. And in it, you clip your doors, and they're absolutely fantastic the way they fit together, and they are sealed against Asian hornets. So that is a real bonus for us. Um, my colleague, this is actually a Voano hive I talked about before, he um, makes his own doors. This is 5.5 mil there, so the hornets can't um, get in, and he, that's the gap he's got there. That works for him, that. It's not brilliant, but it works. Um, we just do what we can, we, we have to adapt. There's some nukes I have. Uh, these are actually the mouse guards for the winter, but they stop hornets getting in as well. So they're really good, they work really well. Okay, so this is us trapping in late summer. So as I said to you before, there is a time sometimes when um, a lot of hornets finish their natural life cycle and the queens emerge. And if it's warm in, September, in late September, October and November, you can get a lot of queens then. And you can see what they're like. It's, this is a kind of bit of a scary movie, but these are, we think these are queens. They've got really big abdomens. They look very shiny and new. So you can just see what you do. We, these, these traps are made by Vesper, Vesper Cats or Vita Farmer make them. They are really good traps and they work really well. Usually things like this are a bit gimmicky, but this particular trap works really well on this. Okay, so uh, a friend of mine lives in the Loire. He had an Asian hornet's nest in a tree. He trapped them heavily the same with uh, apple and white wine, uh, cider vinegar mix, and he got a huge amount of Asian hornets. These are probably all queens out of this one nest, and they all kind of emptied out, and he was able to trap an awful amount, awful lot. That's what one nest can give you, and there's probably maybe another third more of that that will come out of the nest. So if you imagine that you've got all those hornets before they go off and hi hibernate, 
the mortality rate of Asian hornets is quite high. They reckon only probably 20% live to the following spring to start a new nest. As I said to you, it's quite a dangerous time for these founding queens. So they do run the gauntlet. We trap a lot. There's no real predators, but some die as well. There is an actual predatory wasp called uh, Canopsis vesticularis, I think is the name. And it actually lays its eggs in the abdomen of the queen, but it doesn't kill that many. And we were hoping that it would be more because it does kill a few common hornets as well, but it's not that, uh, that predatory and it doesn't do a very good job. And it's not gonna be the savior we were hoping it would be. There's the nest right under the tree, you would have no idea it's there. This is what we do in the spring. These are my old bottle traps I used to use and I've still got some in some apiaries now. This is multi-beer, white wine and black currant juice. Now, um, other people use different mixes, but there's a real consensus that the black currant and the white wine and the beer, it does something. It's not the best thing. We use another uh, attractant now uh, made by Vita Pharma. And the reason why I use that is because if you imagine you've got about 10 traps in 10 apiaries, that's 100 traps to fill and you need an awful lot of beer, white wine and black currant juice. So I um, generally go now with the one I can mix quicker that still works very well as well. But this is just exactly what you see. A little bit of bycatch there, yes, but the other argument is with every Asian hornet queen you catch, if you lose a few flies and insects now, you imagine how much you've saved in the long term when you imagine the damage to the ecosystem with a fully mature Asian hornet's nest, how many insects that queen and her workers will take from the environment compared to trapping now. So it's a good, a good compromise, I think. And later in the summer, we use these traps. When you get a lot of Asian hornets in one area, you want to use effective traps. So we stick a bottle on top of a hive and just cut a V in the top and then put some apple cider vinegar in it and it works great. So there we are, the Vita Farmer traps. These are nukes last autumn. We hang uh, two or three traps, for tw well, one apiary now, we have to have about eight to 10 traps in if you get an, a year like we had last summer. There wasn't very many Asian hornets during the season, but at the end of the summer when the nest finished, they just emptied out and they were just hanging around, stressing the colonies. There you go, gives you some idea and you can see the amount of hornets in there. That's what we make, we make little pegs. Do you see these bits of wood here? That's actually Asian hornet traps between the hives. And I think there's another one over there. It, this is actually, a, we've just done some vaporized oxalic acid treatment here. So we've got, we block the bottom of these nukes off with some foam. So it looks like similar thing, but it's not. That's traps there, another one there. And then we have these little stands we use now, but you have to have, you need to have the traps near the hives because you they almost it almost helps mop up, mop up the hornets. That's what we use as our bait. Uh, it's a liquid you dilute with some straightforward sugar water and it's really effective, it really is good. And that will do probably a hundred traps. So it's a really good um, compromise for us. So colony stress. Asian hornets cause huge colony stress. At the same time, there is often a dearth on. So for us, as I said, that's why I showed you our nectar flow finishing in mid-July, exactly the same time that the um, Asian hornets move and make this big nest in the top of trees or, or in brambles now, but they basically produce their large nest, okay? Um, hornets hunting or hawking in front of your hive are only one sign of the problem. The biggest issue is the fact that you're, you're starting to miss forage bees that are not returning with food and messages for the colony. And this is the part of the colony that's missing. And it's a big part. It stresses the queen. The queen stops laying. Little or no winter bees are made. Huge stresses at a fragile time. And then in the autumn, winter, you'll see beautiful colonies like we had this year. Going into the winter, you think, great, they look fantastic. All the varroas. And there's no varroses. You've done varroa tests, pretty low mite levels. And then you, they, just, they just run out of adult bees. They just die off too early and you, and you get a cold snap and they just go. If you had a mild winter, it's pretty likely they probably would survive. But you know, you get a couple of cold snaps like we've just had and it's the end of it, the colony dies. Um, this is obviously showing you what percentage of the bees are missing. So if you imagine here, the 80, roughly the 18 to 21 year old day bees are involved heavily in guarding the front of the colony. And the ones that are older than that, they're just not coming back in any numbers. 
So it's a big amount of bees you start to miss in the colony. And we've only just realized this in the last couple of years that that was the problem. We were very fixated in listening to all the advice and looking at the front of the hive and looking at the front of the, of the, of the bees and seeing what they're doing. Oh, there's one or two Asian hornets, but it's not a problem. But the, but the deed is done away. The deed is done when the bees are predated, when they're trying to find pollen on the ivy. So that's the issue you have. It's, it's kind of a, an invisible presence. So uh, on to the current methods of finding, excuse me, I'm having a quick drink, of finding uh, Asian hornet nests. How do we locate them? If we, if we had the resources to look for them, how do we locate them? Okay, you could, we know this word now, we know this expression, track and trace, we all know that word at the moment, um, with bait and wick stations. Okay, so you, um, you have a, uh, an attractant, and then you can uh, put that out and watch it. And then hopefully the Asian hornet comes to it and goes from it. And what then you can do is you can mark the Asian hornet and you can time it. And you have a compass and you work out the direction it goes and you can, you can do a calculation and um, uh, maybe hear a little bit more about this after, but you can do a calculation where you work out how long it spends in the nest before it comes back because it will come back to the same bait station. And then you can start marking them and you can, then you can work out telemetry and, and angle and hopefully track to find out where the nest is. Radio tracking has now been done and it's fantastic, but it's a lot of work as well. You have to catch the hornet very, very carefully. You have to basically chill it down. They use ice to chill it so it becomes lethargic. Um, then you um, tag it with uh, the radio tracking device and it's, it's, it's done on like a card. I'll show you in a minute, I've got photographs on that. And then you can follow the signal from that, hopefully back to the nest. And the, one of the latest things uh, they're just trying out now in Jersey now, and I'll talk a lot about Jersey's Asian Hornets in a minute, uh, is they try with dogs. Now dogs are obviously incredibly good at scenting out things. And Asian Hornets, like common Hornets produce a, uh, a, a, a waste product from the base of the colony. And they don't like take like honeybees, they don't take their waste away. They don't to drop it outside or poop outside. They just let it fall from the bottom of the nest. And that plume of debris can be picked up on by dogs. And once dogs are trained, they have been proven already to, uh, to sense where the plume is falling. It's not specific really, because the problem is you have wind. So if you can work with the prevailing wind, you know roughly where that Asian hornet nest might be. But it's, it's something in the working. It's another thing that fantastic lot of work has been done and people are working really hard to try different things. So um, really interesting. So let's look at the Jersey um, scenario. Jersey is very close to the French coast, 14 miles shortest distance. I used to live in Grooveville here, the East Coast. So I know exactly, I used to go to this little reef here when I used to go fishing on my boat. And I can, you can just almost like leap over to France. So we know when the wind's from the East and there's a lot of Asian hornets are in the trees here, how quickly they can just fly over and come to Jersey. And uh, I'll show you some of the data from that. But the Jersey Asian Hornet Group has been formed and they're a team of really highly motivated individuals, not just beekeepers. The key is getting the public involved, because remember, Asian hornets are not just predating bees. They're, they're predating the environment. They're predating the biosystem. They're predating all the food for the other insects, like swallows, like um, spiders, like you know, all these other, well, all these other insects in the food chain are being reduced in an area and it's it basically having an impact on everything. So if, if we can encourage people to help in many different ways, even if it's someone helping trapping or going out, trying to track a nest, which they've done in Jersey, this is what it's all about. And the Jersey example is absolutely fantastic where they've all got together and they've got fantastic people in, out there just going out for a couple of hours every day or every second day, just helping work out where these nests are. So one of the methods I talked about before was wick stations. You um, have an attractant and um, Alistair Christie gave me this photograph. He's the Asian Hornet coordinator for the States of Jersey. And I think he's on tonight and he may be able to come in after and give us some, um, answer some questions if they're asked. Um, but this is one of the things he does and he gives these bottles to the public and they go out and use these to locate the nest. And obviously there's no point in really tracking or trying to find nests until you've got people reporting them. Because 
and until you start seeing hornets in the spring, it's really difficult. And there's no point in kind of tr uh, tracking a single queen. You're better off just killing her because she's not got a nest yet, really, as such. And, and if it's really early in the year, between sort of March, April and May, it's likely she's only ever made that tiny starter nest. So you just kill her. And that's another one down out of the way. So uh, that's a what they're doing. We're using those little marking discs that uh, we uh, mark our queens with and you stick them on top of an Asian hornet. And believe it or not, once you get used to handling hornets, it's not actually that difficult. It's not, it's not, okay, it's easy to get stung, but if you wear leather gloves and you follow a procedure, you won't get stung. So, uh, you know, and by the way, the, the pink is the attractant they were using. It's a, a, a one you can buy and I'll probably find the name out after. Okay, the radio tagging. This is really interesting, this. Um, a radio transmitter is tied to the hornet with Kevlar and then they tie it between the thorax and the abdomen and it's, there's, it's where there's that gap, that flex where the abdomen moves up and down and moves around and it, they use Kevlar because it helps the hornets stop gnawing through it um, because obviously they're so <laughs> incredible, these insects, they do tend to break things pretty quickly. Um, radio tracking is mixed. It's, um, it can have really good effects but you can also lose a few radio trackers and I think they're about 120 pounds each. And uh, you need someone who knows exactly what they're doing. And uh, there is, I say, practical issues. This is how we do it, well, not I do it, but see, you can see here, there's a, a bit of wire there, okay? And that basically holds the Hornet down to this plate. Okay, she's been in, this one's been in the, um, in the ice, so it's pretty docile, but you still gotta be careful. And then the radio track is tied just around there underneath. And there it is, there's the radio tracker tied on. And then obviously the hornet will be allowed to warm up and then it'll fly off and hopefully, hopefully it'll take you to the nest. But it's not always easy. Peter Kennedy from Exeter University has been over and doing lots of work here. It's a, it's a kind of global effort. Everyone's been coming to Jersey from the UK. And I think some people have come from Ireland as well because it's been a, a kind of test case of how we can learn to treat um, or deal with the Asian hornets and trying all these different um, different methods. So uh, the problem is sometimes as well you can have a, you can have a radio signal directly pointing at the tree and actually might be the tree behind you. So it's <laughs> there's always sorts of always kind of practical issues as I say. And uh, as I said, I talked about the tracking dogs before, and I talked about the urine. This is exactly what happens: the dogs can locate it, and this, as I said, has limitations. Okay, so. There you go. That was the, there's the Asian hornet nest in the tree. And there's John DeCartre, who may be on after, I'm not sure, with the two dog handlers. And the, see, the, the problem you have is just the terrain here. This is thick brambles. So trying to get your dogs in that is very difficult. And you do not want your dog to actually come across the nest. It's possible that you could have a starter nest in here, the, the small primary nest, but they can still have Asian hornets on it and still be using it. And they migrated to the tree so your dog could then bump into the nest and get stung, and it's not a very good thing. So this is the resources Jersey have, luckily. When they find the nest, there's the nest. Most of the time they can remove the nest without pesticide. It's absolutely brilliant. They try and not use any pesticide at all. Um, and it, they have basically controlled everything they found, but they're relying on a really good uh, community of people who are doing their own bit to, uh, to help this problem, because it is a problem. So um, I'm gonna round off by my own personal thoughts on the Asian hornets. Okay, they're still keeping bees in, this is the kind of point I always say, they're still keeping bees in the Gironde era of France where the hornets made their debut in 2004. So that's what, 16 years ago? We in Brittany are right on the north coast of France where it's cooler and I maintain that this inhibits the growth of early nests. So we generally seem to have smaller nests. And the question came up last time, what would the Asian hornet size of the nest be in the UK? It, it could be the same as we have here. It could even be bigger because you get temperatures of a continental climate, not on the coast like we are here. So the mid, mid UK, mid island, I don't know, maybe they will be a little bit bigger, but, it, but the sea around us does have an effect. And I, I don't believe it will be a problem. You know, I don't believe they'd ever really fully develop that early to be that big. That's just my opinion. 
Okay, in the UK, nests have been eradicated quickly because of well-placed resources and plenty of foot soldiers. In other words, um, where there has been outbreaks, DEFRA have done a really good job. They've got to it, they've had it well planned, and they've used the Jersey model and they've used tracking devices and, and ways of uh, tracking down the nest. So it's, they've never been able to, um, the nests have never been able to finish their cycle. So they have never had a second generation at the moment, as far as we know. So I do not think that Asian hornets will ever pose a serious threat to honeybees in the UK if the current level of alert is maintained. That's just my opinion. Okay, but the problem, as I showed you before, Jersey have is they're continually getting infected from the French side because they're only 14 miles and the French do what they can and they've had a lot of collaboration between the French and the Jersey side. But the problem is the French coast is huge and the, it's, it's just massive to police. So um, you've got to remember that on our, on, in surface area, France is three times the size of the UK. And um, there's so many more people per square foot in the UK. So that's why I think they always have resources there. This is the Asian Hornet Handbook written by Sarah Bunker. Really good book if you want to find out about their habits, what they do, what they feed on, all that kind of stuff. Really, really good. Um, and I'd just like to say a huge thank you to John DeCartre and Bob Hogg, who are uh, the founding members, I believe, or a couple of the founding members of the Jersey Asian Hornet Group, and also to Alistair Christie, who is the States of Jersey's official coordinator for the Jersey Asian Hornet. So um, thank you very much for your time. I hope you uh, enjoyed the talk. Um, I'm going to go back now and stop sharing. Hopefully we can... Uh, so we can make contact. So, so that was Are you uh, guys still there? That was very interesting. Thank you. Um, we have a bunch of questions. Good. Um, okay, so let's start. This is my second year with bees, two hives. Now I'm going to try to rear queens. It may use the cloak board method. Any pointers? Um, yes, I would just say try it because you've got to try, you've got to try as many methods you can before you can find one that works for you. I don't personally use a cloak board method. Um, I, I just believe that I find it, it's, it, it doesn't give me what's going on in the colony. Uh, it, it's a bit, I, I just prefer my 10 over 10 method. That's what I prefer. But if you wanna try it and you feel happy doing it, try it. That's the most important thing. You've got to try methods. Queen rearing is a, it's not just do one thing, it works. You've got to learn about it. You've got to understand it. Okay. Okay, next one. Um, I think there's a little bit of linguistic problem here. Are there traps for Asian hornets? Obviously there are, you've shown us them. Um, so are these are these homemade traps or? Well, the, the ones I use, I used initially are what we call homemade bottle traps. And they're made from two large Coke bottles. But there's two, there's a disadvantage and an advantage. The problem is they do take a lot of bait for the trap. In other words, you need to sort of put like uh, maybe 250 mil. That's probably a quarter of a pint in it. And with the new Vita Farmer traps, you can have just about 10 mil on the bottom. So when you're doing a lot of trapping in all your apiaries, you can uh, economize on, on bait. Washing out the traps is a little bit more difficult when you've got the old fashioned bottle traps. So I think the bottle traps, if you, if you log on, if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see the ones I, I, show, I show me making one. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really, really easy, but you, you don't really need to be um, making bottle traps unless you've got Asian hornets. You shouldn't be trapping insects because the problem is you're going to get bycatch. And I, I would like to advise people, unless you get Asian hornets and there's been an, a, 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 a recognized outbreak, don't start trapping for Asian hornets because it's unlikely you'll get in and you'll probably do more damage to other insects around. Okay. Um... Let's see. What about using drones to fly up and nuke those nests with insecticides somehow? I presume that's okay. drones, as in the planes rather than the bees. Yeah, well, no, but that, that's all been, that's all been uh, trialed. The problem with um, Asian hornets is you most of the time you can't see the nest. If you do find the nest, the, the difficulty is using a drone to inject the nest in the top of the tree. Now, I know you could say, well, yeah, I've seen drones, they're quite acrobatic and they do, they have become more um, 
dynamic in what they can do. But, but the, we have tried it here. There's loads of videos of French people doing it. There's people with flamethrowers on, on, uh, on drones as well. I know they've been killing hornets' nests and stuff like that. It, um, it really isn't a good idea and it, it's not very accurate and you end up probably losing your drone, to be honest. So uh, okay. it, it's really not a good idea. It just doesn't work. So, so at season's end, when will the live Hornet Queen and workers die off? I assume from cold weather. Okay, right. Yeah, it's a good question because um, I did mention this before, but at the end of the summer, um, if it's warm and mild, and there's plenty of food around, like the last autumn we had, the Asian Hornet workers will keep going. Uh, and that's, that's the problem we have is that's why you have to set lots of traps because you they're just kind of looking around, hanging around. They're kind of predating a bit, but they're, all they're doing is really stressing your colonies. And they will die off, uh, you know, over the autumn because basically there's no new new um, hornets produced in the nest. So it's just a matter of time where they just die of exhaustion. But usually we say around the first frost. But what we find is when you get coldish weather, they just seem to disappear. They just die off. I mean, they're gone. So I hope that answers your question. But it's an interesting question. I, I have to agree. I think this is more a, a comment on the. Uh on the sample uh, trap juice that you had. Do local pubs make up the trap juice? <laughs> uh, so, sorry, I didn't quite un understand the question at the start. How yeah, oh, you know, when you had the glass of, of, uh, of trap juice, I think that's what he's referring to. Do local pubs make up the trap juice? <laughs> no, we, I, just, I just buy, um, the good thing is you can use the cheapest white wine and the cheapest multi beer and it's absolutely fine. But uh, no, I, I see where you're coming from, yeah. Yeah, it's um, um, yeah, that works really well. But for me, the practicalities now of mixing up enough uh, attractant and cleaning out the traps and then renewing them becomes, you know, you end up with like two big five liter um, containers. You've got to lug around your apiaries, and it, it's a lot. You know, it's another thing to have to do, but you have to do it. Yeah. You know? So were those predatory wasps and hornets also an invasive species or are they indigenous? I don't know. I think they are indigenous. I think they've been here because the common hornet Vespa crabo has been here for a long time. But as I say, they're, they're little or, or no use. They don't seem to be having any effect on. We, I was hoping that you'd see there were some biologists talking about it and they were hoping a long time ago that the numbers would hopefully rise of this um, this predatory wasp, but it's it's not really risen into the uh, the numbers to do any good. So um, unfortunately, not. Okay. Um, so the, there's a question about um, let's see, a comment from Alistair, and I think it refers to uh, to this Did question: you, What is what is the Asian hornet's flight range from its nest? Um, what, what is the Asian hornet's flight range? I that's a really good question. I believe it's about one one to two kilometers. Yeah. If there's food around, I, I don't believe it's very far. So I've just but, uh, I've just set up Alistair so he can talk. To okay, me. great. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to have people. If you finish the questions you've got, if you want to allow people to answer ask their own questions, that'd be great. I'm fine for that. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Alistair. Hello, everybody. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, just going back to that question, I fully agree with Richard. The furthest we've ever tracked a hornet back to its nest was about one and a half kilometers. Brilliant. Excellent, thank you. Um, next question, are the hornet nests removed at night when the foragers have returned? Well, uh, Alistair can answer that. Um, yeah, it kind of depends yeah. on how you want to deal with it. Um, if in Jersey we're using, if, if we're using pesticide to deal with a nest, we tend to do it in the daytime because any hornets that are out foraging will come back and get a dose of pesticide. Um, we have used in Jersey um, a method that we call natural removal, which involves um, removing nests without the use of pesticide. Um, and you have to do that at dusk. Uh, it's not without its complications. Um, you still you have to be highly stealthy about it um if it's in a tree remove the branches around the nest in the daytime then go back at dusk and literally bag the nest up in a in a sort of medical grade plastic bag very stealthily and quickly if you get it wrong although hornet the asian hornets don't normally fly at night 
they will fly at night, they will scatter and they will end up being a risk and a downright nuisance to anyone who's got outside lights on at night time within a kilometre. And it can, it, so it's quite a risk. Um, yeah. Uh, so we, we tend to use pesticides a bit more now, but with the provision that we always remove the nest within 48 hours. So we take the pesticide out of the environment. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned that the hornets were spitting venom. Did you mean that literally? And yes, so, I do. Know? They don't do it often, but they can hover and they literally will spray venom at you. Yeah. It's, uh, it's quite a shocking thing when you experience it, you know? <laughs> What's the impact? What's the effect? Well, I mean, there's no real danger to you, but I mean, it's, I, if, I imagine if you did get it in your eyes, it wouldn't be very pleasant. I mean, um, and they do say that some people can react to, it's the same kind of, some people could react to it if they got it into their eyes. Um, but I, I got, I was badly, well, I was stung on the back of my neck by one I found in this other nest I told you about, I found near me. And I thought, oh, there'd be no problem. And I walked away from it and then suddenly bang. And it was, it was a much, much different, sensation than a bee sting and it's more of a profound feeling it's not it's not like it's not an intense pain it's a kind of deep spreading pain it really is um not a very nice thing to it's be it's not with. pleasant no it's not pleasant a bee sting um, you go ah that really hurts and it really hurts quickly whereas an asian hornet it kind of builds it's it's a much much longer pain <laughs> yeah it's not it's not nice um uh, yeah, the spitting venom is an interesting one. I believe um, it's it's not a very nice taste. It's quite bitter, I understand. Um, and um, there's certainly documented instances of causing a sort of conjunctivitis-like symptoms. Um, so we certainly recommend uh, people wear safety glasses at least around when dealing with Asian hornet nests. Um, the sort of mesh of a, of a veil or a, a suit is not enough. We, we wear, wear safety glasses. Okay. Um, apple cider vinegar for use in the late season. What's the makeup of the lure? Um, well, um, it's basically apple cider vinegar you buy in the shop and you just dilute it down sort of half and half. It just seems to work really well. Um, it's quite a new thing we found. We, we, always used to use the same attractant all year but we found that if by just having that appley flavor um and vinegary apple appley flavor the acidic flavor of the apples just seems to really attract them it's it's nothing it's not rocket science but sometimes the simplest things work the best you know um that's I'll, that's what I'll, we do i'll add into that in jersey we 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 we've um we didn't try many sort of homemade attractants and the one that we have generally used is called trap it it used to be called Sutera. It's produced by a British company called Agrisense. And we have found that whilst it is expensive, I accept that, it's the one that seems to work throughout the season the best. Um, I know in Europe and in Spain, they seem to use protein to um, uh, attract and um, uh, the hornets and they only use carbohydrate sweet uh, attractants when they get close to the nests um, that's not something that we've tried in in jersey um, you know pro carrying protein like prawns or fish around is is not the most fragrant thing to be doing in the summertime in jersey in the back of your car so we've stuck with bottles of liquid attractant okay um so this is a different one. So what, how many brood boxes do you normally use when using a queen excluder? And what's the advantage to your choice? Um, I, I don't really understand the question. In, in what, what context do you think is queen rearing? It must be. Well, um, brood boxes, I, I use a, a, just a single dadent brood box. Um, and then our queen excluders on top of that, if that was the question. Um, our, our brood boxes, our, our dadent frames are deep, so we uh, there's quite a lot of brood can be running in the in the bottom of that colony. Um, we only ever single run a single brood box. Okay. Um, as I say, that our, our dadent to give you some idea, it's a, it, two British nationals, one on top of another, are still not as big as a full dadent frame, a dadent brood box. So okay. it's, it's like it's like a British national and 2.2 or something. So. Uh, Okay. It's, a, it's a big box. Yeah. Um, what's your preferred varroa treatment? 
Okay. Um, recently, I was using um, Amitraz, which is obviously Apivar. I'm not using that anymore. This, as from this year, we're going to be trying caging our queens immediately. Our nectar flow is finished, and then we're going to be using vaporized oxalic acid on day 24 to day 25 because we think that Amitraz is now finished with, and it's becoming uh, the bees basically love it. Sorry, the, the mites seem to love it. They don't seem to be having. We're getting huge. What the problem is, we're getting huge mite drops and huge counts even after uh, we've used it for the correct dose and everything. So we've just got to come away from it. And I know that other people will be using other treatments and they're just not working very well. So I'd urge people out there to monitor your mites very carefully because that's a good point to bring in is that if you're going to have it, if, if for us here to have the Asian hornet problem is only doable if you have the rest of your colonies managed well. In other words, your varroa mite levels are down because if you've got diseased or weak colonies, they ain't going to stand the hope in hell against um, Asian hornets. You've got to have strong colonies from the start. That's one of the fundamental ways of giving, uh, of dealing with Asian hornets is keeping your colony strong. So, uh, um, yeah, Amitraz is finished now as far as we're concerned. Okay. We don't know if it's going to work, but we're pretty sure we'll have a result. So we'll lose some queens. We've got spares. That's all we can do. Okay. Um, do temperatures play a role in the spread of the Asian hornet? So I, I didn't quite catch the question. Uh, do temperatures play a role in the, in the spread? Of the um, I believe they do. Obviously, in the spring, the release of the founding queens uh, from the previous year, that can be delayed. And um, if it's not that warm, they won't go as far. But I do believe, I, Alistair will probably be able to help me out here. I do believe uh -huh. a queen can go at least 10 kilometers, maybe 15, if she's moving to find a new place to, to start a nest. I can't remember the exact um but obviously if it's cold that's going to obviously impinge that yeah but, it, so. I, I i'm sure it is a factor the problem is we just don't know enough about it um but i, I did post in the in the, in the questions here that um you know for you guys in 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 ireland you have to remember that they are fighting an outbreak of asian hornets in hamburg um, they turned up there in 2019. They did suspect it might be a new incursion from Asia, but the genetics apparently indicate that the hornets came from France. Now, the nearest closest hornets to Hamburg in France are over 300 miles away. So they seem to have hitched a lift on some form of transport, whether, you know, freight or someone's caravan or something like that. So there's, there's you know, that should raise alarm bells for you guys with your ferry links in Ireland to France. Um, but um, also you should um, uh, note that Hamburg, I understand, is on the same latitude as Manchester and looking further westwards, Dublin. So, you know, I think that should raise alarm bells uh, within Ireland about the uh, potential possibility of Asian hornets establishing themselves there. How successfully? We just don't know. The size of the nests that they might get to, we just don't know. But it should raise alarm bells. Yep. Um, what do you pay for a beta pharma trap if you need six or eight for apiary? Okay, um, I've just bought some last week and I a think... Few pounds. Yeah. Four or five pounds, something like that. Yeah, but we, when you buy in bulk, you can get them a little bit cheaper. I think I'm going to buy... Uh, I think they're three euros fifty for us each trap when you buy twenty five or thirty at a time. So, um, but I, I can't remember the exact price. <laughs> but the, but the, but the new ones are good. They have refined them a lot. They've made the traps uh, uh, more of a, a more rigid material, and you can use them year after year. So it's a kind of an investment, a bit like buying an extra piece of beekeeping equipment that we obviously always need. Um, but it's just something that we uh, have to have, you know, we, we cannot not have it now. Right. So, so the, there's a related question. What are the best traps and bait to use? Well, I have to say it, it is that the Vita Pharma traps really uh, overall as, as a global trap, they're very effective, you know, for trapping spring queens. So, um, yeah. Um, and the, but the ones I use at the end of the year, that was the point that at the end of the year, it's like a free for all. If you get this warm period and you get the nest emptying out and there's all these Asian hornets hanging around, it seems to me that most traps work really well. Anything you use, bottles that are just, even a bottle, you can actually buy 
There's a product out now. It's it's like a yellow cap that screws on to a standard Coke bottle or a lemonade bottle or a mineral water bottle. And in the top of that yellow cap, it's not actually a cap. It's actually an entrance way. So the, the, the hornets see the yellow and then they pick up on the odor, but it's actually a trap you can hang and it allows you to hang this bottle up. Um, and it's a really good thing to have at the, I should have had a picture of it. It's a really good thing to have at the end of the year. Not really as a, maybe as a spring trap at the right time, but certainly not in the summer because you will get bycatch with it. Um, but it's, it's another trap that works well. I would add into the trap side of things. We use the Vita Pharma traps in Jersey, but we adapt them with six millimeter holes around them to allow bycatch to escape. I've seen queen wasps escape through those holes. Uh, bumblebees can't. We also encourage our volunteers in Jersey to monitor their traps on a daily basis, if possible, you know, every other day, certainly. Um, we also adapt the traps so that they don't have a liquid reservoir of attractant that kills everything. A uh, couple of ways of doing that. One is to just put a sponge inside the trap and absorb the attractant on that. But we also use, um, I think uh, Richard might have posted a picture, something that we call wick pots, which are little reservoirs with a, a fabric wick that allows the attractant to sort of be pilloried up through it. And uh, there's very little death from bycatch insects, but they still catch Asian hornets. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, the, one, the, one downside, the one downside is, uh, Alistair, you have to then kill the Asian hornet if you catch one. In the yeah, but of course, <laughs> in Jersey, we are... Uh, we're using the Asian hornets to right. track them I understand. back to the nests. Yeah. So that's a very specific process we are under undertaking in Jersey. Okay. Yep. For um, us, uh, we like our hornets dead, but there again, we have not not much <laughs> not much other hope here, really. <laughs> so um, yeah. Okay. Are are the hornets territorial? Will you have multiple nests within their flight zones? Um, Alistair, if you want to answer that personally, I, I I'd don't say they're know. not territorial at all. Um, certainly at bait stations, you will see hornets sort of jostling each other. And I've always had a sense that they may be from different nests. They sort of don't settle, they kind of a bit of argy bargy between them. But you often see hornets at a bait station and some fly off in one direction and some fly off in another direction. Um, in terms of multiple nests, I've certainly seen photographs of multiple nests strung along guttering in northern Spain. So there is no sense that there's a sort of territorial um, a sort of uh, competition from the hornets. Uh, you know, they can be as, as, as little as 10, 20 metres apart. Well, one, one thing I will add is I've always been told in France that by many people who uh, are said to know about Asian hornets that when you see two together and they're fighting, that is the sign that there is two nests. Exactly. So yeah. we, we would assume it is, but we don't know for sure. Yeah, yeah. Because when you see two other hornets come, they often don't fight because we think they might be from the same nest. So that probably is correct, but we're not 100% sure. Yeah. Um, and there's a, just a comment that in Devon, Somerset, we were called traffic by the pallet load to reduce the price by 50%. Which is... Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that comes back to, um, I think the sort of bottom line on that comment, probably from Mark, was um, um, collaboration between the, the regional bodies that may be fighting Asian hornets. I mean, you work together, group together your order of trap it, or, you know, your order of beer, wine and cider, if you really want to, um, and collaborate with each other, then you'll have a bit of purchasing power in there. Yep. Um, okay, so Alistair has already answered that, but for everybody else, we had a week with nights of minus 14 centigrade, 10 days ago in the Netherlands. Yeah. Will this kill Asian horn of Queens in hibernation? And Alistair already responded, no, it's not if they're in full hibernation. No. If you, if you look at their native country, they're well adapted to cold temperatures yeah, yeah. and surviving, unfortunately. The, the danger for them is, I think, more um, variable uh, weather conditions. So if you have warm weather and they come out of hibernation and then you go back into a cold phase, they are, they're in extreme danger. But I guess they've evolved to have a sort of um, a, a sort of uh, staged and varied 
emergence from hibernation. But, you know, we've got warm weather in Jersey here, 14 degrees is forecast tomorrow. Um, I'd love it if it plummeted, uh, um, you know, in the next couple of weeks down to sort of zero degrees for a week. I think that would uh, help our Asian Hornet situation. here. I, I can add to that. I, I have seen um, a starter nest that I wasn't able to intervene to. Now, whether this, this was to do with the temperature, but we were having 16s and 17s like we're having now, and there was a starter nest in, in, in an old outbuilding. I came back and it had gone really cold and wet, and the bees weren't flying for probably a week, and the queen was dead, and we looked like it was starvation. So um, it, it, you could never prove it. It's just a theory, but it, I, I completely agree with that. If we had, if you have fluctuation temperatures, it makes that queen starting out job a real challenge. Yeah. And uh, I, I really think that is a, one of the ways that nature does help us a little bit. Yeah. Um, okay, there's hope for Ireland yet. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And what, what, we're, what we could add is that this time is um, with the Jersey example, um, it's really important now to get into place some um, ground teams uh, ready for when it does, it, it's pretty likely it will come over and it won't be flying. It'll probably hitch a lift on one of the ferries from Roscoff or something like that. And, and it is completely feasible it'll happen. Oh, yeah. But it's really good now for beekeepers to put pressure on your government to lobby your MPs to start organizing something through. I don't know, I don't know if you have DEFRA in, in Southern Ireland, if, but I know you probably do in Northern Ireland, but um, it's really important that you start looking at ways of putting into place resources for this, because it will come if you don't. And when it comes and you're not ready for it, then you'll trip up like they did here. Actually, our Department of Agriculture does have sentinel hives specifically for these, but you know whether or not they will actually trap them. Did, did, did you say sentinel hives? Yes. Yeah, well, we're, funny, we actually spoke about this on the talk I gave the other day. And Alistair, you can, because you, can, you, you had a point, Alistair, that um, I think you said that the sentinel hives don't we the Asian hornets won't necessarily go to the hives and that's no. the no. they're not really a way of um, what you need to rely on is the public you need to um, get people to using the app to educate them about that um, I'm not sure if the app's available to you guys there but I'm sure it is somewhere it's really important that you kind of familiarize yourself with what it looks like so if you get a founding queen there that you can find it and track it before it's too late yeah, I think public awareness is key. Um, you know, the the um, Asian Hornet teams in the UK are working uh, closely and closer with um, uh, the National Bee Unit on all this. Um, but um, and I know many of them are, you know, they're holding um, sort of public awareness campaigns outside garden centres, for example, um, just trying to spread the sort of message and raise alert. But be beekeepers are in the forefront of this. It's not only beekeepers, of course, but beekeepers are in the forefront of it. Um, I think, and in sort of port areas, I'd certainly encourage um, uh, monitoring traps. Um, not sure about sentinel beehives. We certainly haven't done that um, here. Um, we would we would go for traps and being properly monitored and public awareness and, and clear and easy reporting protocols. Yeah. Um, do the authorities in Brittany and presumably uh, the question applies to Jersey to fund any nest removal and who would destroy the nest? Presumably OK, well, at the moment, um, there is a service that, the, for instance, the nest I showed out here was removed by the commune. Now, if you don't know what a commune is, a commune is basically the same as a parish. Um, so there's like lots of little parishes here and they all and they have a mairie, uh, so which is like, you know, the mayor or the, or the town, you know, the town hall kind of thing. And then what happens is you go and tell and they use they use the, the, the group that's been um, organized to come and destroy it. And there's no charge at all. But in terms of a nest in a tree that they can't find, there's no resources for that. They are not tracking. They are not. Um, using radio tracking. They are trialing it in places in France, but it's such, you imagine the, the size of the country here, there's just not the resources. And that's the problem that Jersey is having is that um, the French coast, as much as there's good communications between French and Jersey and the trackers on both sides, and there's this really good feeling, they just can't get to all the nests on the French coast. And at the end of every year, 
there's obviously a certain amount that, that make the, the Queens the following year, and then Jersey gets reinfected. I've seen a question here, is Jersey trying to eradicate it totally? Well, of course, Jersey's trying to eradicate it totally, but because of the French um, um, proximity, you're always getting reinfection. Yeah, we um, in the, in the springtime last year we picked up a fair number of queens on our northeast coast. I monitor I monitor weather conditions, and it ties in perfectly with a sort of you know four or five knot wind from the northeast and the easterly direction. So we, we know we know where they're coming from. Um, uh, yeah, and it's uh, we each spring we, we sort of developed a system each spring of having a. Um, kind of a line of traps on that north and east uh, coast, um, both on the coastline and about half a kilometer inland as well. Um, do you use open mesh floor or clothes to help combat the Asian hornet? Uh, yeah, very good question. I, well, sorry, Alice, I don't know if you wanted to. No, I don't, I don't think that's a factor at all. I've okay, yeah, well, really I thought agree. about that one. Yeah. No, when we, we talked the other day about um, the grill, you can you see on some videos, a lot of people are trying this grill on the front. And when I was talking about um, having the grass longer in front of your hives, the whole idea is the Asian hornets are quite smart. They won't go through the small hole, whereas the um, whereas the, the bees will, because they know it's their home, obviously. But um, the grill on the front gives the, the returning bees a little bit more of a, of a cover to dart back. Um, and but in regard to open mesh floors, I do use them now, but our data hives have, uh, I'll, show, I'll talk about the bases, they do have a mesh, uh, but it's a much thicker, it's not really a, a metal mesh, it's a plastic grill, and it doesn't really seem to have any effect. The problem is, when you're commercial and you have so many, I've got 200 colonies, I can't be buying these, um, maybe helping uh, alternatives that might be, we have to just do what we can uh, the, the, one of the one of the things we've learned to do is we've staggered our hives now so that you have I still have them on my pallets I have a, a two tires a pallet and the two hives on it but we stagger them so we put one rather than having a line we we recess one and bring one forward so we we're breaking that that um, patrolling line that the Asian hornets were taking up we're having to adapt ourselves so we're making it more difficult for them and easier for our bees to return um, but open mesh floors seems to make no difference at all. Yeah. Um, not, not much more I can really say about that. Just the last two, it's just reiterating the public awareness and, you know, it's important. But there's an interesting comment from Irv saying that hunters could also be of help since they hang out in, in the woods uh, quite a bit. You know, too. Absolutely. All, all um, nature, um, what's the word? Nature users, experiences, people are out there, whether they're um, you know, whether they're out there uh, rambling, whether they're shooting, whether they're hunting, whether they're tracking, whatever they're doing, whether they're orienteering, everybody needs to be kind of um, alerted to this issue. And that's why it's so important. We're talking about the new forest of the day, that um, how it's such a big area for the UK on the South Coast, where it's potentially a hotspot for Asian hornets. And there's so many people that use it for mountain biking, for, for climbing, all that kind of stuff. You know, there's so many things you can do there but they're not the kind of people you'd associate with bees and beekeeping, but they're still people that we need to get to, to say, look, just keep an eye out for this. If you're, if you're orienteering and you see this insect on the ground, or if you see it flying by, have, take, a, take a photograph of it, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's what we need to do. And that's what I'm talking about before is you need to get, our, your beekeepers need to get kind of together and think about a way of contacting everybody so that it's publicized. It's really worth doing because everybody wins. Because you, if you have an Asian, prob, Asian hornet problem, it becomes a major problem. Now, just to mention as well, we, don't, we have a, a problem with them here, but they're not anything like the problem they're having with them in Portugal right now and in Spain. It is a veritable disaster down there for them because they've got much higher temperatures. The, they seem to do much better. Um, I've seen pictures of, um, or incident, we also talked about um, these electric harps you can get. They're like mesh you hang, you hang in your apiary. The bees can fly through them, but the Asian hornets can't, and they're actually charged. They, you put a voltage across them, and when they fly into the harp, they get zapped. 
Uh, so like, it's like one of those little electric zapper bats you can have for killing flies, but on a big scale. And they work really well. And I've seen pictures of those strung up in, in apiaries in Spain. And they have a tray underneath that, that was full of soapy water or, or a sticky pad. And it's just full of these hornets. I mean, they, they're having multiple nests in, 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 in the areas there. And it's just, it's frightening watching the pictures. For, when, when I see our bees here, we are lucky. So that's what you don't want to have. Just a, a question for me, actually. I, I read there a couple of years ago about people catching hornets and painting them with, with poison in an effort to try to destabilize the nest when the, when the hornet flew on. Have you ever come across that? Um, I can't comment because I'm not. <laughs> okay. Yes, I know this method and it works really well. Okay. okay. What you do is you take, you can paint a tiny bit of uh, there is a way of doing it, and I wasn't going to mention it because I'm technically allowed to, but because you've asked me and I do know about it, I will tell you all about it. What you can do is you can, it's what you call baiting the nest, and you put a tiny bit of insecticide on the thorax, not on the abdomen. You paint it on the back of the Asian hornet. The Asian hornet goes back to the nest. The amount of insecticide you use is tiny, but the only downside is the insecticide is in the nest, okay? But... But this is, this is the big but. You are targeting just the nest and it works. So I know people in Portugal that do it. A friend of mine does it and you can clear up an area infested in about a week and it's unbelievable. So uh, it's illegal because it's not a registered protocol. It's not a registered treatment, but people are becoming so desperate they're doing it and it works brilliantly. So it's, it's a balance. What do you do? Do you have your, your Asian hornets pill, pillaging your, your hives or, or do you put a tiny bit of insecticide on a back of two or three of them? That's all it takes because a small amount of insecticide will kill the nest over the course of a week. Because when that Asian hornet goes back into the nest, um, the, bee, the other hornets will clean that off and they'll spread it around the colony and the nest dies over the course of two or three days, maybe a week. And what's, what's worse, losing all the insects to the environment around as that nest continues to develop and grow as well as your bees. It's the dilemma we face, what do you do? It's ethically, technically not the right thing to do, but it is probably one of the best things you could do. But I can't say that, I'm not allowed to. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, somebody just commented that the Asian Hornet Watch app is available in Ireland. I've not, I, don't Brilliant. Know, okay. I don't know if yeah. there's- you just, you, you, you just need, I think, probably to check that the, uh, any information posted um, or reported through it goes back to relevant authorities who can process that information um, appropriately. Yeah. Um, there are lots of potential different ways of reporting Asian hornets that could be considered. Um, just something to bear in mind. I know in the in the UK um, last year they received, I think it was 9,442 reports of Asian hornets. Only one was an Asian hornet. Right. And someone has to um, monitor the system, triage those reports and work out what is what. And my personal feeling is that there'll be a lot of those reports that are definitely not Asian report, uh, Asian hornets. And believe me, I get some strange things reported to me from bumblebees and blue bottles and all sorts of things. Uh, grasshoppers even have been reported as Asian hornets. Um, so there'll be a good proportion that are definitely not Asian hornets. And But between those and the definitely are Asian hornets, there's a lot of very murky ground. And that is where I feel the battle will be lost. And, you know, that is where... Um, people have to sort of concentrate on effective systems of following up those reports, perhaps uh, interviewing reporters, setting up some monitoring traps, just to be sure that you're not missing something, an Asian hornet, that's been badly reported. Um, yeah, absolutely. Interesting area. And here's a, an interesting one from Rachel Hayden, who is an Irish contributor on the Atlantic Positive Project. Where they yeah, prevent congratulations. Yeah. So there's the uh, so that uh, their goal is to prevent the spread and impact of the Asian hornet to the Atlantic area. I, I hadn't heard of this this project. And the Irish Eye were looking at all aspects of a potential invasion in Ireland and aim to share information and experience from experts to be researchers to raise awareness. 
So that's good. At least we have somebody looking at looking out for them on our side. But you know, as yeah. if we get nine thousand warnings, then it's not going to help much if there's just one person to process them all. Yeah, there's um the Atlantic project is um is great. We've been working with Exeter University on the radio tracking and um you know look at, they've been looking at sort of damage to sort of pollinators. If I remember right, I think there's a sort of dozen academic institutions across Europe that have been involved in various aspects of it. Um, and there's some European money behind it all. Um, the work is um, ongoing, but um, yeah, I think um, it's a positive project. Um, encourage people to sort of share what they're working on, involve beekeepers and, and all the various stakeholders in, in learning as much about this um, invasive insect as quickly as possible and developing systems and methods to um, control and eradicate it. Yeah. Um, just as an interesting comment here that a different place to spot the, the hornets uh, from John de Carteret, I presume from Jersey. He is from Jersey, yeah. Yeah, who says that they've been seen feeding on roadkill and on dead fish washed up on the beach, which is, you know, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and somebody just asked, why is the poison not registered? Presumably that's, the, you know, painting the, uh, the the hornets and sending them back home. Um, well, I, I, can, I can add to that. It, it's just fipronil that you get in, that you treat your cat with for ticks. But it, what I'm trying to say is it's not homologated. It's not a recognized treatment. And we can't tell anybody to go and say, put this on the back of a hornet. It's just not what you do. It's like saying, treat your, treat your cat with olive oil. You know, you don't put olive oil, it'll kill them. It will kill the, the fleas, but it wouldn't do a lot of good to your cat. It's, it's just not what you do. The, the, there's protocols and laws and regulations and, and, and there comes a very fine line with this. The, the, the problem is that I think that the truth is the government really doesn't know wherever you are, the government really doesn't know the answer either. Because we can't, we can't fix the problem. We've always been, we've been waiting for this silver bullet quote with this. Um, uh, there's a, supposedly some um, biologists that have isolated this super attractant that, that a hornet releases when it's under stress and it attracts other hornets to it. And we've been waiting for this for years, but it's still not come out. And we don't know whether it's. So what we're saying is we don't really know what the best solution is. We're trying every possibility, and until. Um, someone can release a product that is deemed to be, you know, ticks all the boxes and has all the tests and it's, it's safe. We, we can't be doing that because it's not been homologated for that. So it's, it's, it's basically illegal. But I mean, I, <laughs> well, that's all I can say, you know. There are a lot of clever ideas out there from, um, you know, warn, uh, audio warning systems that pick up the vibrational frequencies of the wings and can send a message to your app. I've even come across one chap who's who's using low intensity lasers and he's developed a system that he thinks can actually blast hornets out of the air in front of the beehive. I mean, it sounds Star Wars ish, but there's some quite clever people uh, on the sound side of things. Um, you know, I, I've, I've heard of people sort of from ideas of developing directional sound detection systems. So you literally point something at the trees and it'll tell you whether there's a, a nest up there. Um, you know, some of it sounds fantastical, but um, there are a lot of clever minds on this problem, and we hope that uh, methods will be developed. Probably not a silver bullet, but working in conjunction with each other, these methods can tip the balance in favour of beekeepers and other pollinating ecology. Yeah, yeah Alice, I, I just mentioned as well, um, Jackie Rowland here has just said, I think in the UK it's illegal to release Asian hornets that you've caught and to track unless you are licensed, and that's absolutely correct. Yes, Jersey is the. This is very big thing, and you can clarify this, Alice, if you want to carry on, because I know John De Cartre reminded us of this last week that Jersey is unique in its situation. Yes, um, yeah. So the, the the work, the tracking work that we do in Jersey, we're able to do it because we have different legal systems here. And it is not illegal to um, catch and release an invasive species, whereas I understand that is the case in the UK. Um, so I don't know what you know what happens in in Ireland on that. So um, 
yeah, you can catch and report, but you can't catch and, and release. But that gives us the advantage here of being able to track individually marked hornets back to their nests um, through a process that um, developed by a chap and, and refined by a chap called Bob Hogg in Jersey. Um, and it works very well indeed. Um, it's, uh, it's great fun as well. Um, the thrill of the chase. Yep. We have the same room. You can't just release it. Yep. Okay, I think I think that's all the questions. So I will say thank you very much, Richard, and thank you, Alistair, for jumping in and helping. No, that's fine. Glad to help. Um, yeah, thanks, Alistair. As usual, you're a, a wealth of uh, official knowledge. No, no, no. It's very, very different circumstances for us here in Jersey compared to you. Um, I, I, I don't envy the, the issues that you're dealing with with Asian hornets. We, over the last few years, have certainly had incident of hawkings in front of uh, hives, but um, uh, I'm not aware that we've ever lost a hive through um, uh, predation by Asian hornets. Um, we've been able to, to, to um, the moment hawkings reported, we've been able to mobilize our volunteers and set up uh, a tracking team to catch some of them and track those hornets back to the nest. And, and deal with it. Um, we believe in Jersey that's the only guaranteed way of protecting your hives is to, to carry out that work. But it is a collaborative process, takes a bit of time um, and, and some resources to do that. Okay, so thank you again. And thank you everybody for attending and for all the questions. And uh, so I'll just say good night. Good. Yeah, Pleasure. thank you everybody. Nice to meet you all. I um, hope you all enjoyed the talk. It's great fun to reaching out to everybody. And with all this, we're just communicating together, working through these, hopefully putting the ideas and how we can work through these problems. Um, great fun to be uh, on this Zoom in all these times of uh, COVID. So uh, goodbye to you all. Don't forget you can. I'll give myself a plug now. Don't forget you can catch me on my YouTube channel. Just put in Richard Noel Bees and I've got a channel I run there. All sorts of stuff about keeping bees in Brittany. So uh, until the next time, take care. Bye-bye. All, All right. right. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you.